thank you so very much again. Um, I'm John S. Walker. I am not from here. I'm from uh, the Midwest. I'm a native of Columbus, Ohio, born and raised there, and um, proud always to declare that I'm a battling Buckeye from Ohio State. Uh, if anybody didn't like it, you can meet me in a parking lot at any time. Now, um, I'm also, um, I've been here now, good heavens, 50 years. I've been here since 1966. Mm -hmm. um, I've done many things. I've taught 20, 28 years at uh, Monroe Community College. I was in the History and Political Science Department. I've also taught at St. John Fisher. I've taught the Summer Institute at Nazareth College, and I've been um, in and out of uh, URMC now for about 10 years. We had some special projects uh, that we were doing, but this is my first stint as a um, professor, and I'm very pleased and very happy to be with you. I've been retired from full-time teaching now for a bit. Oh yes, I meant to mention that I also have taught about 17 years as an adjunct at the Divinity School, the local Divinity School. That's where I received my master's degree from. Um, but um, I'm acclimated. I feel like a Rochesterian. Um, I love winters like this because they remind me of winters back home where it's very little snow. And you can get in your car and you can drive from one point to another point without worrying about getting stuck. So I love that. Uh, I know it's coming, but I'm going to enjoy every wet minute of it until it gets here. But we're going to um, uh, have a, I hope, to have a good session. We have several things that we're going to do, and I'm going to pass out now, uh, for your information, the um, information for the course will be on two sides, and I'll explain it as, uh, as we go along. One, two, three, four. Would you take one and pass it? We're happy to have with us today uh, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille, who will be, who will be uh, filming, the, filming the class for us. I guess at this point I should say, are you ready for your close-up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming, too. And if everyone has that, um, the, the course description will uh, define itself. But what, what we want to look at the, over, the overarching um, theme of our class is poverty. And we're going to look at poverty, how it relates particularly to mental health. We're going to talk about um, uh, women and men uh, who are returning home from prison and the trauma that they uh, go through with respect to that. But we're also going to talk about returning combat veterans, uh, the traumatic stress that most combat veterans have. Most combat veterans have uh, issues of mental illness that has never been um, quite uh, analyzed correctly, and for the most part, never treated. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in detail. Um, I am a veteran, and um, I have been in a veteran's hospital, and uh, I know from um, direct experience some of the things that uh, uh, used to present themselves but still do in some um, situations. Uh, we're going to look at the black church uh, throughout this as a therapeutic center, even though it's not, it doesn't um, identify itself as a therapeutic center, but for those who are African American and who have any level of stress or mental health as an issue or as a direct uh, or, or it has a direct impact upon they and their families. We'll discuss that too. We want to look at mental health issues as it relates to immigration, both immigration coming into this country from other lands as well as internal 
um, migration and the uh, defining issue well, well, well really would be two. It would be the Dust Bowl exodus and experiences of poor white farmers in the 1930s. If you've seen the movie or read the book by John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath, uh, you, you can identify with that uh, very easily. We'll also talk about uh, the most impactful internal United States uh, migration in history. That was the great migration of black people from the deep and rural south to the urban north. Some um, 3.8 million uh, between 1914 and 1920. My grandparents were a part of that. Now we shall also look, if we have enough time, think, th the thing about uh, a course like this, you can go on and on and on, uh, because there's so many issues that uh, we want to explore, but we'll deal with them as best we can. Um, but one of the things that uh, has always really been um, interesting to me and uh, very important. Good morning. morning. As an issue, well, here, here um, you might take one of these, please. And if you please sign your name as well. And, um, that we will hope, that we will be able to get into, and that is the importance of black music as a form of mental health therapy. Both, we're gonna look at the Delta Blues, the Urban Blues, that was, that was uh, part of that transition, the Delta to Chicago particularly for the creation of the Urban Blues. And we're gonna look at big bands, The quartet singing, both quartet singing uh, so-called secular music and quartet singing of spiritual music. Oh, thank you. And then finally, finally, we're going to look at the small band explosions characterized by the music of Charlie Parker and John Coltrane, if we have enough time. Hopefully we will, we never know. Now, incidental to each of the phases that you'll see on the other side of your, of your paper, we will have guest presenters who will be coming and spending a morning with us, uh, to helping us to define as well as to discuss uh, some of the issues at hand. And they all will be, um, in my opinion, um, people who can discuss these from experience. We'll have a presenter when we talk about the PTSD, uh, post-traumatic syndrome uh, that exists with combat veterans, with, as it uh, exists in the um, poor black community, poor black community's relationship to medical and mental health communities. We'll look at um, the situation with respect to post incarcerants and their families. And the fourth phase, of course, would be the immigration uh, in America. The, the fifth, if we get to it, we may not. These dates are all very um, shaky. Uh, they depend upon fluidity, and I've never taught one course in my life, and I've done a lot of teaching, where fluidity has been a part of it you know, because of the fact that I defer to my students. I wish for you to discuss things. Sometimes that takes longer than the time will permit, but nonetheless, we'll, 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 we'll try to do that. Um, we have some uh, readings for you, but they're not in yet. And when they come in, you'll get them. Uh, not all of these now. I'll, 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 I'll just speculate uh, for you the ones that uh, you, I'm not expecting you, for example, in the first phase, it's mostly lecturing. And I don't expect you to do, uh, buy anything like the script counseling services, the National Suicide Prevention, Suicide Prevention Application. Those are separate studies that were found in, in magazines and journals. Forget those. 
Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, unless you have something handy, you can get that. And the only thing, the only book that um, would have any relationship to uh, our first phase would be by uh, Maurice Friedman and his book, Religion and Psychology. So you can kind of put a check next to that. I'll let you know when those all come in. And the second phase, now the second phase will call for some uh, reading of Friedman's book again. But Victor Frankl, Victor Frankl was a Jewish, a European Jewish psychiatrist. As a young man, he was off and running, practicing psychiatry in Europe. But being Jewish, he was victimized by the Holocaust that he and his family <clears throat> spent from 1939 until the end of the war in a German concentration camp. But this is where, as a young intellectual, he developed his theory of logotherapy and eugenics, and we'll talk about those briefly, but it has a major impact. It, it's had a major impact on me. I learned about Frankel when I was in college. When I came to graduate school, uh, you know, praise God. He was a major part of one of the courses that I took. Um, but I found that his approach to counseling people with mental stress through eugenics and through what he called his application of local therapy works. It's, it's very, it's very strong. It's very strong because it coincides very much with the Mark. If you re read uh, Maurice Friedman's book, there's a chapter that he that he dedicates um, fully, um, and this chapter uh, that um, he dedicates fully to the this theory of of, of um, eugenics calls to mind. Uh, very closely, uh, the, the statement, the phrase existential grace, and that is the, the sharing of experiences between counselor, and using a term, because I know of none to replace it at this point, counseling. Uh, but it's very, uh, it's very interesting, as we'll, we'll see. When we get down to um, the third phase, um, we talk about um, prison, the prison experiences uh, of men and women now, uh, because we'll look at some statistics in all of this, but the statistics relating to women going to prison is higher now than ever before in American history. Um, since ni eight, uh, since uh, 1980, the numbers <coughs> of women uh, incarcerated has uh, nearly tripled. Uh, that causes a major concern with us because of the incidents uh, that are so prevalent yet with HIV and AIDS. And most of these women are childbearing age. They don't spend that much time in prison, but they come out, they can still have children. And if they have not been treated uh, substantially with respect to this disease, it spells trouble. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll talk about that because that's very important in, for the societal makeup of today's world, particularly. Uh, in this country. Um, one of the things that has always been ignored, but to me and to many, very substantially important, and that is what I have written down as the racial, the religious, and the social consequences of immigration into America. Now, when we say racial, we're not only talking about relationships between black and white. We're talking about relationships between ethnics, white ethnics and white people. This is where xenophobia comes in. This is what causes uh, some people to uh, become particularly popular uh, even today. Uh, so we'll look at that and how that has a lingering effect. Um, some have gotten through it, some still struggle. Uh, so we'll see how that's done. I'll, let me share something about, <clears throat> with respect to that, that's rather humorous. Happened to me during one of the years I was doing the Summer Institute at in Nazareth College. I have, um, I was working at that time <clears throat> with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Rochester. And in Summer Institute, um, the 
name of one of the chapters was uh, written in the Italian language. So I had a, a buddy who was an Italian-American who uh, worked at the diocese as a director of programming. And so I didn't really realize what the term was. I couldn't identify it, so I called him. And I spelled that out for him. And he said, well, I'm Italian, but you called the wrong person. I said, what do you mean? Tell me what it means. He said, my grandparents, who came from Italy, counseled his mother and his father, who were first-generation Italian-Americans born here in the 1930s, that they should not ever speak Italian among the children. Nothing but English. Mm -hmm. And he said they grew up not knowing their mother tongue. And he was so embarrassed. So I tell him, well, don't worry about that. I don't, mind, I don't know mine either. English is a second language to all black people as well. But uh, that language thing is very difficult. Uh, once it's eradicated, it's very difficult to kind of maneuver your way through life. It's good to have that language that really defines us as to who we are. You know, no matter where we come from, where we come from, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Germany, it doesn't really matter as long as we know we have some understanding as to who we are. That's why so much time is spent now <clears throat> in genealogical societies. Um, my, one of my daughters, who lives in Maryland, for a birthday present one year, um, surprised me with a genealogical study of our family background. My paternal side went all the way back to slavery, and my forebears, my ancestors, were captured from the <clears throat> uh, uh, very small African state of Benin. And um, they traced everything from Benin to Alabama, from Alabama to Cincinnati, from Cincinnati to Columbus. And I don't know what it's going to do with my life now that I'm here, but hopefully one of these days from Columbus to Rochester. This is where all of my children, <coughs> pardon me, all of my children were born here. So um, it's very interesting, isn't it? Once you find out where you're from, you really start scrambling, trying to find out more. It's very exciting. And I hope if you don't know uh, your family background ancestrally, that you'll take some time to uh, try to find that out. It's uh, very, very good. One, uh, one, you remember the, you, know, you weren't born, but the book, has been extant now for 40 years. If you're familiar with Roots, the story of Roots, and how uh, Kunta Kente and all of that, and how um, Alex Haley, who wrote the book, was able, was inspired through the book to run his uh, ancestry, which he did successfully. Um, I taught one class on Roots, they, when it was very popular, and I taught this class in 1976 at Monroe Community College. A lot of people were asking for it. I had a class, it was a night class, and it was packed. I had more white students in that class than I had black students. So one of my, my only um, requirement for the course, I wanted every member of the class to take the responsibility of doing the best they can to check their family background. One young, and I had them read it, they did it, and they, I had them do it a month ahead of time so they could read it, everybody had to read their family background. This one young lady, come in. Good morning. Here's, uh, here's something for you. This is our tree film, or syllabus rather. Thank you. And, you are, and I'd like for you to sign your name to this before you leave. Okay. You can take it with you in the back. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And she was so proud of the fact that she had traced her family back to Canada and that one of her great-great-uncles was a train robber, a notorious train robber who was called the Canadian Jesse James because he, the money that he took off trains he supposedly distributed to the poor. And she read that with such pride. And I said, well, that's all right. You know, that's, uh, at least he has a sense of humanity. But uh, it's good to trace back who we are. And, uh, find out why we act the way that we do, why we walk the way that we do, why we use some mannerisms in our personality, why we talk like we do. Uh, it's very good. So I want all of us to uh, take advantage of that. Now, um, 
if you look at the third phase, poverty and mental health issues of post incarcerants people coming out of prison and their families. We're including women, as I said, I want that to be understood, women as well as men. I'm only, uh, there are two books. Michelle Alexander's book is very popular right now. Uh, I believe she spoke uh, in Rochester recently. Uh, she's spoken here at least twice, but it's The New Jim Crow. Uh, that's a very popular book. It's, it's a uh, you can get it almost at any bookstore. Probably have copies here. But Lennox Hines book, who is a, a defense attorney, uh, his book is a little more difficult to find, but it's printed by the Iowa State University, but it's Illusions of Justice. And um, it goes back a few years, but it's still uh, very timely in terms of issues that uh, he does present. Some of the very same ones that Michelle Alexander takes a step uh, beyond him. Um, all right, now we have some new people that have come in. I'm going to stop just for a moment and uh, we'll ask if there are any questions up to this point and then we want to uh, uh, greet uh, our three new friends that have come into the class. Do you have any questions so far? We'll, we're still, we'll be on this for a couple of minutes after, after this though. Um, now, if there are no questions, then uh, let's uh, look at what we're going to do. Now, we, we're not going to have that much time. What I'd like for us to do is to spend from, after we get acclimated and everything, uh, 9.05, I think that'd be good, 9.05 to about uh, quarter of 10, 10 minutes of 10, or depending as to how, like we used to say. Now, I use a lot of theological language, but we'll take care of things as the spirit leads us. If we finish at 10 minutes of 10, then we'll spend some time with discussion. But I'd like to be sure that all of your minds are clear uh, by the time we leave the class. <clears throat> How many of you have 1030 classes? Okay. Of River Campus. Well, okay. technically I'm from there. Oh, okay. I'm All right. So we can go over a little bit, that won't hurt you in terms of geographically okay. getting where you have to go. So we might do that since nobody has anything between 10.15 and 10.30, just something that's very, very important with, with a presenter maybe we might want to ask. But at any rate, we'll try to uh, satisfy everyone's uh, query relative to uh, what we're going to do. All right, now, um, what I want you to do though, I want you to ask questions and I want you to have a firm understanding of what we're talking about. When we say poverty and mental health, <clears throat> many of us have an understanding that there are issues of mental health that are found primarily among poor people. That's not to say at all that poor people um, stimulate mental health with their lifestyle. No, that's not true. Uh, Many of us are born in poor families, but we still uh, get a good hold on life and make, make life good. That's because within poor families, uh, you have loving parents whose educational level might be low, but their level of loving their children very high. And they push children uh, to uh, excel, they push children primarily to get an education. But then we have some families um, that have been destabilized because of poverty. Um, other issues that are related to poverty, poverty rather, we'll be looking at. And particularly when we talk about crime uh, and that things of this nature, uh, or the, probably, the phase where we discuss uh, what happens in the poor community, particularly particularly through faith agencies, churches, and other religious assemblies, and mental health and medical health issues. Those of you who are, who are from out of the city, and even perhaps uh, some of you who were born in the city or close to here, for a very, very long time, there was a major element of distrust among poor people and 
this institution, both the hospital and what would be developed as the mental health uh, programs. Uh, we're trying to bridge that now. And I think that a course like this will certainly help us because one of the things that we'll be talking about uh, very strongly in the second phase will be just how this relationship uh, has been uh, mishandled and how it's being handled now, uh, attempting to make up for lost time. And there's nothing wrong with trying to make up for lost time, nothing whatsoever. Better that than nothing. But uh, we need to really look at uh, some of these issues as it relates directly to the institution that we're attending. Um, but you are very fortunate in that you are here now uh, because I think my hope is that people who leave will serve the world. My college, I went to Morris College. It's a small private liberal arts school in uh, South Carolina. But our motto, we had a mantra, and that was uh, enter to learn, depart to serve. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a good one. It's not original for our school, but it's a good one because it, it, it fits well. Uh, and when we have a small school, you can do it. URMC is small in terms of, of numbers and whatnot, but it's major in terms of its impact already in the world. Uh, very powerful particular the medical aspect, uh, research is going on. Uh, if everything is even minimally successful, it would be a major uh, uptick in the health of uh, this community, this nation, and uh, we pray to this world, but uh, it's, it's going to go along. Now, one other thing that is going to be very new to you, let me share with you that I am not a technological person, so, you know, this, these things, what do you call those, point, point something? PowerPoint? Yeah, PowerPoint. You know, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. You know, here's my PowerPoint. <laughs> I just learned how to handle emails, <laughs> and it had not been for my nine-year-old daughter, I would not know it now. You know, I, anything technological that happens to me, I give it to her. I mean, in two minutes, it's healed, it's, it's, it's fixed. Uh, that, that's the way it goes. Uh, you're born in a different era than I. All of my academic training has been without computers. The library was our focus. Research, going to different cities, going to different universities, on our own expense to do research. Working on a PhD was all reading. That's all it was, reading and finding sources and, doing research and things of this nature. But uh, that's a well-defined uh, way of becoming educated. Uh, but I have no problem with uh, technological education so long as it's understood that uh, we live in a, we should be living in a hands-on uh, society. Uh, you, you cannot, I cannot explain to you the importance of, the, of human intimacy. You can sit back and write about poor people all you want, read about poverty all you want, but unless you go down and stay with people that are being affected, you'll never know. I saw a very stimulating documentary on television Tuesday night. It was, no, Monday night, Martin Luther King's holiday. It was, it, it was in two parts, though. The first part dealt with um, the segregation era and some of the difficulties that uh, black people were having. Then the second part dealt with an unknown oppression, the oppression of poor white people in Kentucky and in West Virginia, and how the government has stolen their land, how the government has defoliated their land, <clears throat> and how the government is using their land as landfills without their input. It was, it was amazing. And these were poor white people who had no one to, do, uh, to go to bat for them at all. So what they did was what Saul Alinsky teaches all poor communities, organize. And that's what they did. They organized and they found out that they, by organizing, they could have strength to resist. And that's what's needed, resisting oppressive forces. 
resisting oppressive forces. Uh, so all of us have come from, um, whether um, we understand that history or not, all of us have basically come out of oppressive situations. Uh, things weren't good for many, many people uh, coming into this country. That's one of the things we're going to look at here. Uh, but immigration, this country is built on the strength of immigration. Slavery, good heavens. Those poor people never got paid anything. And then all of the artisans who came from Europe, all of the doctors who came from Europe, all of the psychologists like Sigmund Freud, who his family had to escape, had to escape the German concentration that was going on for all professional Jews. Had to, what they, what they have given to the world is immense. What immigrate, Im immigrants have given to this country uh, is great. Uh, so this country is built on the strength of, of, of people who uh, are, 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 are coming into the country uh, from other areas. And that certainly includes people from Latin, Central, and South America. Uh, they have come, they have brought their genius and their creativity. Mostly they brought their backs because they have been chief sources of labor. But nonetheless, it takes labor to build a civilization. Uh, but we need to treat those who do labor with as much respect and equality and justness as uh, the world will permit. But let me go on and let this, and let, so we can wrap things up for today. Now, I've written down my little thing, my little thing here. Uh, you, I, I, some professors have it on there, they have it there. And you say, they'll say, read them. And any questions, they say, real quick, all right, then they'll go something else. Uh, let me read it to you very carefully. It's not long. Uh, oh, it isn't all these pages. I'm mean, just tackling just this. <laughs> two paragraphs. Now, I sincerely welcome you to the course of study on poverty race and mental illness in urban America. We're going to kind of shift a little bit. Uh, urban, yeah, but we, you really can't talk about urban without talking about the rural. Uh, how are you going to do that? Because so many people in urban America uh, really have a rural American experience. So, you know, we kind of shift that a little as we go along. Now, this is just one course with hopefully four phases to explore, all based on mental health trauma and both its individual and collective, as a people, effects. And we're going to look at, as you've seen on your syllabus, the four dimensions of these, four dimensions, combat veterans, community faith agencies and mental health and medical agencies. That's one look. We're going to look at prisons and post-release issues. And we're going to carry as far as we can the issues of immigration, both external and internal. Now, if time permits, some attention will be given to black music as mental health therapy. An attempt will be made as well to establish lines between poverty, race, and mental health. Poverty, race, and mental health, and the need to address them concurrently if a solution is to be I think that whatever human dilemmas we face, no matter what they are, I think there's a resolve for all of them. But they need to be addressed sincerely in order to achieve effectiveness. All of the stuff that we have been able to develop, scientifically and otherwise, Look at, our, look, look at the difference in food now. Although I think that people are still healthy in times back. Our grandparents made us eat our vegetables. You know, so, you know, we, 
I grew up with broccoli. You know, I didn't like it, but I grew up with it. I had to eat it. Uh, but just look at the improvements that have been made health-wise, just through foods. So we have all of these capacities for change. Now, do we spend our time making neutron bombs, or use, do we use that same, uh, those same scientific revelations to develop uh, anti-poverty situations and things uh, that will in, in, increase our physical health, like medicine? All of us, you know, when I was a kid, I used to hear grown people talk about they hope that in their lifetime uh, cancer can be defeated. And people have been saying that for years and years and years. Now, you're young enough that it now is a reality. With all of the research going in, why can't we find a solution to eradicate cancer from the table of human disease, particularly childhood cancer? I was up at... Uh, Galasano Children's Pediatric Hospital. For the first time, I was amazed. Beautiful. A lot of research going on. A lot of our children are being saved. Uh, or at least their lives are being extended. I've never been to St. Jude Research Hospital, but all the money you send to St. Jude is a known fact that that money is going into research. And it's proven to be particularly effective for children having various forms of brain cancer. But, uh, but you know, there are things that we could do. The President of the United States has the power to call together people from all over this country in a particular profession. I hope that Mr. Trump will have the guidance to bring in people who are medical people, scientific people, to deal primarily with disease eradication. We can do it. We can do it. The only thing that's keeping us from doing it is the fact that, well, those who do it, it's non-profit. So what? So what? Money isn't everything. It helps, but it's not everything. Stroke team, call the emergency department critical care bay. Stroke team, call the emergency department critical care bay. That scared me from more than I thought it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. But let's continue. Um, now, be beneath all of the, the things that we'll talk about, beneath all of the issues is the issue of spirituality and the psychological impact of guilt and sin. Now, those of you who are taking public health and those of you who are taking courses in psychology, if you read Maurer, uh, you know that he spends a great deal of time relating mental health issues to guilt and sin. Uh, <coughs> pardon me person suffering through uh, religious uh, kinds of uh, difficulty. Um, there's much truth to that. Um, in my counseling, um, that seems to lie at the bottom of, of, most, of the, most of the issues um, and something that does need to be uh, looked at. And we, that's where the, we look at the church as a therapeutic institution uh, without having understanding that it's a therapeutic institution. Now, we're going to look at the spectra of race in all of this. But the aspect of race is less in the veterans' experiences because all, let me personalize it, all of us guys go through the same kind of some of it is racial, but it is more general. But it becomes manifest, though, in areas and situations that have yet to be, I think, fully addressed. Now, what we plan to do is we're going to have guest presenters at some, at some of these, at, at these phases at some point. Um, and we want them to share with us and you to share with them so that we can have appropriate information. Um, but um, that's where we are. Does everyone, I think my office number, yes, yeah, office number is at the bottom. I, I can be reached by email. Uh, that other email, as well as the regular email, but I have my, my personal iPad that I carry with me. Uh, you can see that under email as well. 
so you can also get that with me as well as my email from the um, from the school. Don't worry, I I've been able to master it. Send me some email. So don't worry about that. I keep it with me all the time. It's at my office right now. Any questions you might have? All right. Why don't you think about it? Um, we reconvene on Monday. We reconvene at 9 o'clock. Um, I hopefully will have the attendance roster by that time. If, but if not, we'll continue just, as I'm, just so you can get credit for it. Uh, since this is a credit course, I want everybody to certainly get their credit. I want you to do me a favor, though. You have drop an ad here. All right. Now, if you plan to drop the course, please tell me. That's be very important. I'm not going to chastise you. I'm going to wish you well, but I need to know so I can uh, eliminate your name from um, uh, future um, things that will be done. So you can get good ideas from people in the past. So don't uh, neglect or reject what some writers and some disciplines were doing, say, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Freud wrote, what, 100 years ago. Uh, I don't like him. My favorite psychologist was Carl Jung. I, thought, I, love, I love Carl Jung's writing because I can relate to it. I can't relate to anything Freud says. The id and the ego, no. Hate your mother, no, I love my mother. Uh -uh. So, you know, that's weird. I think he's weird, but he's pronounced as great. And he was. Einstein's theories, I don't understand them. Relativity, I know a little bit about. But I, I, I like Einstein simply because of who he was and what he did in terms of the mind that this country has been able to, to grasp and to move forward with. So read, just read a lot, and uh, uh, you'll find it to be very good. Everything you read, my grandmother said, everything you put up here, nobody can take from you. They can take your car, they can take your house, they can steal your clothes, they can take anything you, anything you have that's material, but they can't touch what you put in your brain. That's there. It's there forever. And you can have instant recall. Instant recall. Um, you can. Now you're not old enough. But once you get to the point, let's say the age where you can seriously fall in love with somebody, and let's say that that relationship breaks, years down the road, you'll hear an old song that will remind you of that person. And you'll be brooding for a week thinking about that person. Wonder what she, wonder what he is doing now. So everything is up here. And given the opportunity, it will always come back. Right to the fore. Everything you learn back there. Whether you liked it or not, it's back there. I have math back there. I don't like this back there. <laughs> call on it. Call on it. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Let's read a lot and get ourselves uh, together. Now, what, uh, could you tell everybody what's going on with the camera? Um, at this point, Jen, who's organized this session, intends, I guess, to video each uh, presentation. So if you're not here, it may be available. I'm not sure how they're going to deal with that. Uh, well, we certainly thank you for being here. Huh? It's always interesting. And I like it. I like the position that he's at. Most people with cameras and things, they get behind me, and they get my bald spot. <laughs> he, he can't see my bald spot. He gets his hair. hair. <laughs> well, I have trouble with the light reflecting on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Any questions that you might have? We're going to leave early. I want you to just be, be prepared. This is your first day of class? Mm -hmm. All right, good. First day of class, uh, classes rather, uh, in between. So how many classes you have today? One, this, is two, this is Wednesday? Well, just two? All right. Three, three, three. Most of you are taking three or four courses full time? Mm -hmm. four, four courses or five? Four or five. Four or five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did they have a maximum of the amount of hours you can take? And when I was in college, you couldn't take more than 19. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, it's it's right. like four classes and maybe some labs or five classes. And just... All right. That sounds good, though. All right. 
Good. You have a, and you enough time in between to read, eat healthy, good, and uh, get 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 eight hours sleep, and then up and at them the next morning. All right. So.